Hi, good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining the webinar. Um, so today we're going to talk about IBP and how effective or why effective leadership is so critical. Um, I'll let Flavio, uh, my colleague, so my name is Debbie Heaton, but I'll let Flavio, my colleague, um, do the introductions. Um, but first of all, there's just a few technical details we need to make you aware of uh, this afternoon. If you would like to ask us questions relating to today's presentation, either during the session or at the end, please use the questions box in the control panel. Throughout the webinar, we'll also be conducting some polls. These will be made obvious to you throughout the session, and we'd be really grateful for you, your participation. We'll ask you when to select your answer. You just need to click on the screen. This webinar is being recorded, and we'll provide you with the details at the end of the session on how to view it afterwards. And if at any point you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please contact us via the Q&A box and we'll try to help you. In the meantime, we hope you enjoy the webinar. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you're dialing from. Uh, we're delighted to have you today on this webinar. Uh, I'm Flavio, but we'll go through some formal introductions first. And uh, let me also thank you uh, up front, uh, William Ayn and Mustafa from Danone, who have uh, very kindly accepted to be with us today. Now, in terms of the agenda, uh, we're going to go through, as I said, some introductions. Um, then Oliver White, uh, we will share with you what's our perspective on integrated business planning, which we believe many of you already know and probably practice in your businesses. Uh, we're going to have some panel discussions on integrated business planning, and we're also going to run two polling sessions, so you will have a chance to actually vote and uh, give us your feedback on the subject. In terms of uh, Oliver White, as you know, Debbie and myself, we belong to a, an international consultancy company. Um, our founder, uh, an American gentleman, in the in 69, created the company in the beginning to actually help many businesses um, manage what were then um, tools that were being developed to manage materials, and then it became supply chain, and then we talked about MRP2, and then it became SNOP and IBP, and we actually have been um, taking companies through many, many journeys in time, probably more than 2,000 in the course of 35 years um, to integrate and optimize the business. Um, we're all coming from uh, companies and industries of any kind, and we have, uh, uh, I would say, lots of credentials in our business before joining Oliver White. So uh, I'll give Debbie the chance to introduce herself now, Debbie. Yeah, thanks, Savio. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Debbie Heaton. Um, I, uh, like Flavio, am one of the partners in the Oliver White business. Um, I've actually been in the partnership for 11 years now. Uh, my background was in fast-moving consumer goods. Um, I also worked in uh, pharmaceuticals as well. I worked in Nestle in the food division, um, and I also worked then for Abbott Laboratories, which is a global pharmaceutical organization uh, in both organizations as um, my, my career being in sales and marketing, uh, and lastly in Abbott, um, where I was a sales and marketing director. Uh, I encountered uh, IBP uh, and Oliver White um, during uh, my uh, career when I was with Abbott, where we implemented a global integrated business planning process. Um, I was appointed the role um, as the European implementation director, uh, and uh, a very successful journey it was. I think that's enough about me, um, but that's what qualifies me to now be part of the Oliver White organization. Uh, thank you, Debbie. And <clears throat> just some words about myself. Um, I have uh, started my career in uh, the technical manager for uh, polymer businesses or chemical businesses, and then have spent the rest of my life before Oliver White in uh, what you will now call uh, healthcare consumer goods. And at the time, we had Oliver White as our consultants back in the late 90s, and we developed what then was uh, sales operations planning, which actually managed uh, in, through the supply chain branch, but also the commercial division, and I became managing director for Iberian Commercial Operations. 
I'm an associate uh, since 2004, and uh, must say enjoyed all this year in company of the, the respective friends and colleagues. Um, now we are not a big uh, consulting company, as you might know. However, when we ran a, a survey recently, we found that a third of Fortune 500 companies actually work or have worked with us. And uh, Looking at the number of participants now, I'm sure some of you also do that. But enough of marketing for Oliver White. Let's now uh, hand over to Willemine and Mustafa, our dear friends from Danone. Willemine, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for having uh, us here. It, uh, um, uh, we love to talk about it also because you helped us uh, in our journey, I should say. Um, <coughs> I'm head of uh, global supply chain capabilities uh, since uh, 12 years working in supply chain, teaching and uh, uh, in all different uh, fields, logistics and, and uh, warehousing, planning, anything. I joined Danone six years ago as a Benelux planning manager where I was responsible to, um, uh, uh, to bring IDP to life, first in the Netherlands and then in uh, Benelux so to integrate two different uh, processes. And now I'm in the role responsible globally to uh, roll out the IBP capabilities um, and also to, for convenience improvement. Prior, I worked for a pharmaceutical company and a utility company, so something different, but uh, always supply chain. Um, I love to work with uh, people and, uh, and people management. Um, IDP, as I uh, my journey in the known is especially around this, and um, uh, also in this role when I'm working in headquarter of uh, of the early life nutrition division, uh, I work on process strategy and the implementation of this. And finally, out of office, I'm a mom of three young kids, and I am a hit fan. And if you don't know, it's high intensity training, and uh, that's what I do. Debbie will know. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mustafa. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Flavio. Thank you, Debbie and uh, Oliver White for having us today. Uh, and thank you everyone who, uh, who dug in to, uh, to listen to uh, the broadcast today. My name is uh, Mustafa Azadian. I'm currently a commercial lead with uh, Danone based in the Middle East, uh, managing one of the countries in our cluster. Uh, but this is not why I'm here. The reason why I'm here is because previously I was managing the IBP integration of um, uh, IBP integration in the Middle East uh, for Danone. Um, I come from a diverse background, mainly mainly focused around supply chain as well. Um, I have uh, 10 years of experience. Uh, six of them I've spent here in Danone. Before that, I worked with Procter and Gamble in supply chain as well, and in DHL Express in uh, in business analytics. Uh, my main areas of expertise are mainly towards the business side uh, and the commercial side of, uh, of the enterprise. Uh, so that's mainly around planning, uh, processes, solutions, and systems. Uh, whenever I'm not uh, between the four walls of the enterprise, I'm, uh, I'm a photographer and I'm a obstacle course enthusiast. Okay. Two very fit people. <laughs> so you're you're the right people for an for an, an IBP implementation. You can run fast and you can uh, avoid obstacles, I guess. Uh, could you it's run fast and run long. <laughs> could you could you please explain our listeners uh, or tell them about the known because I guess they would associate uh, the known immediately with yogurt and dairy. But I mean, we talk about a very specific uh, division. Could could some of you please tell us uh, to take our people through that for? A, for a short while. So what is the known early life nutrition? What do you do? Willemine, would you like to take that part? Yes, it's good. We have, uh, we're the known. Um, we have uh, four different divisions. Uh, one for dairy, so the yogurt, probably uh, many of you will know. One for water, it's where, for example, Avian is a brand. And one for advanced medical nutrition and one for early life nutrition. Uh, so the, the, the baby food. Our vision is that we make everyday count for you and your baby. That's, that's now yeah, you can imagine for the early life um, uh, nutrition uh, department, and that's also what we strongly believe in. Um, uh, what we um, uh, what what we bring is the first thousand days uh, the right nutrition for the baby. 
uh, so the person can grow up until a healthy, uh, a healthy grown up. Um, we are um, all around the world uh, in in many countries. The biggest uh, country, uh, of, uh, let's say the top three countries, is uh, uh, China and uh, UK and Indonesia. That's where we're big. We have different uh, brands, different names of brands. I have to say, uh, most is milk, and in a small part, especially in Europe, we also sell uh, uh, foods like the the, the jars. Um, and uh, we have a revenue of um, uh, 7.1 billion, and uh, we have uh, around 110,000 uh, people working for Danone. That's Danone, I would say. It's all about health. That's the interesting part about it. Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Um, so just on the um, next piece, we, we, we're keen to get into the... Uh, questions. So we've got quite a number of sessions for, or, or certainly questions for Willamine and Mustafa. Um, but just a little bit of perspective. Um, what we uh, wanted just to uh, let you know about, really, in terms of our view of success and what uh, IBP really brings to an organisation. Uh, some of some of you who've, um, I guess, some of you on the webinar will have gone through the journey, some of you may be starting, some of you in the middle, some of you may be just interested in the subject of integrated business planning or interested in actually embarking on that journey. Um, our perspective practically is that um, quite often uh, organizations set the ambition or the, the bar just too low. Uh, and I think it's certainly our role and, and we certainly play a very strong part in this it's just to, to kind of inspire organizations and business leaders to really understand uh, that integrated business planning actually enables you as an organization and enables the leadership team uh, to really focus on what they need to do in order to deliver business growth. Um, Flavio and I, uh, and I'm sure the guys, um, so both Willemine and, and uh, Mustafa will have a practical perspective on this also. But uh, I have never worked with um, a CEO uh, who looks to uh, implement uh, IVP because they want to, you know, they don't, they don't get out of bed to improve demand plan accuracy uh, or to increase stock turns. What gets them out of bed uh, in terms of being excited uh, about integrated business planning and the reason to do this, because it's not an easy journey, the reason to do this is because it helps them deliver their strategic goals. It doesn't replace the strategic planning process, but it is the mechanism that helps the organization and the leadership team focus on the right investments and make timely decisions and reorganizations in terms of their objectives, how to reallocate um, activities, sales force um, uh, activities and investments to really be able to drive uh, revenue in the organization. Uh, the statistics you can see in front of you are taken from uh, research. Um, so this is independent. We, we didn't pay for this, but uh, we like the results um, because it, it says exactly what I just outlined. So of organizations and leaders that were interviewed, the number one benefit that was attributed to IVP was increased revenue. And again, some of you may be surprised by that, but those organizations that succeed really understand that as they set out on the journey. There are, of course, operational uh, benefits. Um, and um, again, statistically, these are um, what we see uh, in terms of supply chain performance and, uh, and benchmarking uh, supply chains where we uh, know that, that organization has a capable IVP process. So what you can see there is, I mean, we have disadvantage, parity, and capable IBP uh, groups. Those organizations um, that operate to that capable IBP level, obviously from a supply chain performance perspective, uh, perform uh, much higher uh, than those in the disadvantage of the parity uh, groups. Uh, and again, statistically, uh, the large number uh, of organizations uh, within that, that industry benchmark. So I guess just a few tips, and I'm sure Will and mine and Mustafa um, will also reinforce some of these uh, as we start to go through some of the questions we have for those guys. 
Um, but what we know um, makes organizations succeed, uh, these are the real characteristics. So first and foremost, it has to be led and owned by the executive team. Uh, if the executive team aren't excited, if they don't sponsor this, if they don't drive this, then you know, quite frankly uh, and brutally, organizations will fail. Um, you know, this is not about uh, delegating to good managers in the organization. This is about the executive team really focusing and, and directing their organization on the IVP journey. The leadership guys, so the, the, the team needs to be educated. They need to understand what they're getting themselves into. Um, so there's commitment, um, but that's obviously the, the commitment is only achieved when the uh, leadership team really understands and are therefore completely engaged, eyes wide open as they go into the journey and really understanding what it will take to make this happen. The process itself is very logical. Um, it's really, and for those of you who've gone through this journey, you will know this, it's the change management uh, that is uh, particularly uh, tough, uh, particularly important, uh, but again, that change management needs to be understood and needs to be driven uh, by the leadership team. So accountability, uh, again, uh, it's with the top management, uh, you can't delegate this. Uh, and the implementation manager and IBP process leader must report into the executive. Um, so again, if this is the process that belongs to the executive team, uh, then the guys who are coordinating and facilitating this process need to be reporting in so that they are fully cognizant of the needs um, of the worry circle of the executive team, uh, but also uh, are able to highlight any change, change management challenges on the journey. Again, um, you need to resource the process um, in terms of good facilitators. So through the five steps of IBP, you know, we need good uh, portfolio management or portfolio planning managers. We need good demand managers. We need good supply planning um, uh, supply chain planning uh, facilitators. We need good IBP facilitators. Uh, and that doesn't mean you give those guys in your organization uh, the role. So it's not, those who have the time aren't necessarily the right ones. These have to be good quality, good caliber people in your organization that you're looking to develop. And um, again, what we would strongly advocate is that in rolling out IBP, Design the process quickly and implement ugly. So get going. Um, if you don't get going with this, but you learn by doing the process, uh, and this is not about dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the design, you'll learn that as you evolve. So start quickly and keep the momentum. Again, what makes it succeed is that uh, the team and the organization understand that this is the process to help you run the business. There's no other decisions made outside, you know, the, 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 the big investment decisions, the organizational uh, decisions, uh, where we um, reallocate resources, those decisions are made within this process, not outside of it. Um, and also, as I've referred to, as an organization, you really understand the behavioral change uh, that, this, that is required to really make a success of this. Um, finally, and then uh, we'll get into the questions really, I suppose from our take, um, these are the pitfalls and these are the things to avoid. Um, so I think I already referred to this, do not delegate um, to, and again, this is not to downplay you know, good managers in the business, but the executive team needs to maintain that uh, ownership. Where we see this fail is where the ownership has been delegated to uh, management uh, level in the organization. Um, where leaders avoid education, you fail. Um, and that's because again, there's no common understanding in the organization uh, and no common awareness of the change management required to really make this happen. It kind of links to the next one is around the excitement. So um, if there's a real lack of excitement for this, um, if you put the accountability at too low a level, if you don't have uh, the roles that I mentioned in terms of the facilitators, the coordinators of the steps, um, if implementation is too slow, then quite often uh, it will result in, in failure because we'll lose the momentum. We won't have the right accountabilities at the right level. Uh, and last but certainly not least, um, where um, organizations fall into the trap uh, of getting the supply chain to own this process, 
um, again, is a characteristic of failure. That doesn't mean that supply chain aren't typically uh, heavily involved and heavily uh, steer and sponsor this, because quite frankly, it's most often the supply chain guys who, uh, I guess, start off and spark off the interest uh, and create that interest in their executive team. However, if within the organization this is perceived as a supply chain process, you will fail. Again, it goes back to this is the process that, that runs the business. It's not the process that just runs the supply chain. So thank you, Debbie. And um, we've given us, I guess, um, 20 or 30 years of experience in implementing uh, SNOP IBP in many, many different industries, including our own. I think the time has now come to ask some questions to our uh, guests. So um, Willemine and uh, Mustafa, could you please share with our listeners uh, what you know what were the um, the key the key points were, were, which were the the milestones that I had to go through in your uh, journey to get to where you are now which is what we regard a, a very good uh, process and by the way for our listeners you should know that in the known this is known as GPS which actually is a we find a good word because it's global position system so it's really a, a long term or a long range radar that tells the known about where they're going with their business before they hit a rock somewhere where an iceberg in the ocean. So please, Willemine and Mustafa, share with our <laughs> listeners what were your experiences. Yes, we will. Um, yes, uh, 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 I recognize a lot of the, uh, the, the things Debbie just um, shared, how you can be successful and uh, how not. Um, I would say first we needed a reason to have uh, what we called uh, GPS, so to, to have this uh, IBP to integrate. We needed a reason for that, and uh, for us the reason was on one hand that we uh, uh, got a new uh, financial view on uh, on um, not reporting, but also on uh, on the strategy planning, which was the rolling forecast, uh, where we wanted to get rid of this very heavy uh, year-end lending process, this very heavy uh, financial uh, planning uh, towards the rolling planning, uh, more efficient and also uh, better to steer as you have uh, monthly uh, touch points. Uh, and on the other hand, we also, like all FMCGs, I would say, uh, uh, the world got uh, more uh, volatile uh, um, and, and, and uh, more dynamic. So we had to do, we, we needed a tool uh, to be able to adapt um, quicker uh, on, on the future expected uh, happenings. So uh, then Project Crystal was born, uh, the, the project where we wanted to uh, bring our IBP or our SNOP maybe even by that time uh, to the next level uh, to make it integrated business planning to really get in the same drumbeat as what we had with finance, uh, the process, finance project, the rolling forecast project. Um, we worked with a very big cross-functional team, people from uh, the, the sales units, people from the global team, people from marketing, from sales, different functions. Um, uh, and, and with the cross-functional group, we designed this new integrated business planning. Um, one of the big topics was the agenda. So how do you build this uh, the, the drumbeat? Uh, so you can be that you can have one process to run your business and one process for your uh, volume outlook i have to say and one process for your financial outlook um, so we build it uh, all the way from the the local uh, sales units uh, how they uh, create their plans all the way up to the global uh, consolidation uh, we also build a lot of um, uh, tools and templates and it was one harmonized way of working. All the business units had to work like, or all the countries had to work like this. So it was one mandatory uh, route. We also were lucky that the other divisions also needed uh, this new way of working. So we worked a lot together with the waters division and with um, dairy and uh, medical division, where now we see the, the added value of it that we can really learn from each other where we can improve and what are the challenges and how to overcome them. So I think that was the, the, the reason to have it. 
and then we build a lot of, uh, of uh, then we build the, the, the uh, yearly drumbeat, the, of the monthly drumbeat, you have to say. And we build also a certain concept, which we say is the one pager concept and fixed meeting agenda. So we build ID cards per meetings to be very uh, directive in a sense, uh, how every sales unit uh, could roll out this new integrated business planning. And that's what we did. And then for a local perspective, CBU perspective, Mustafa, I think you can perfectly add. Yes, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the mind. I would say for us from a, uh, from a local perspective, we're kind of driven by a pure business need uh, to have a, uh, a very strong process and uh, very robust tools to really help us navigate uh, a difficult and un unprecedented situation where for the first time here in the region, we're facing a decline in the category. And you can imagine what happens if the category is declining after a double digit growth for, uh, I think since we started actually measuring the category, we've never had any decline before that. It's it, it sent the entire organization running around just trying to figure out what was happening. And in such times, usually what you can face is different, uh, I'll tell you, you would have on your hands different forecasts, coming from marketing, from supply chain. Uh, you have uh, different risk assessments of uh, different markets as well, innovation halts. So the entire business kind of stops, uh, stops growing, stops evolving in a natural and a, in a healthy manner and uh, require kind of a kickstart, a reignition. And this is where uh, IBP came in at the right time for us. It, it really helped us, um, I would say, take over the business and uh, handle it with a bit more confidence, have way more better alignment inside the organization, cross divisionally, cross functionally, uh, and being able to come up with, I would say, one set of figures, one risk profile assessment for the entire situation, um, and uh, a good plan to deal with the current situation. However, turn the entire organization's efforts into how can we deal with the future and how can we deal with this new reality and all of that is not really possible without that really strong backbone that is provided to IBP. Thank you very much Mustafa. So uh, I hope uh, we answered your question. <laughs> so I guess uh, if you could uh, just crystallize in a few words what benefits have you taken so far from the process. I mean, you've spoken about anticipation, about um, uh, difficult um, economic um, environment. Um, I mean, uh, Willemann has spoken about the discipline, the execution, the drumbeat. Have you have you driven any other, uh, perhaps financial benefits so far from the process you could share with us? I uh, had only one um, uh, one set of assumptions to create our uh, financial outlook, but also our volume outlook. Uh, the, even though the numbers could be different, which is uh, what we have agreed on. However, um, uh, we could easily understand where our outlook came from based on on one set of assumptions. So that's where it financially helped us. We could understand our financial outlook. Uh, it was more transparent and also in the sense of risks and ops uh, because of this uh, backbone process, it is, it is, uh, it's easier to foresee your future as you know uh, your market dynamics um, and you have one aligned view, cross-functional view on uh, where your business will go through. Um, so we also had a better a uh, better uh, view on our risks and ops, which is from a financial perspective very uh, relevant. Thank you. So now we open the poll to everyone. We promised you one. Here it is. There's four questions uh, which you can vote against. And that is now you in your businesses, what are the benefits that you have derived from an IVP uh, program? Uh, business growth, increased profit, cost reduction, or perhaps you're still in the journey and you're still uh, measuring and getting a fix on those results. Please vote. <coughs> oh, 
So meanwhile here, uh, if you allow me, Flavio, I'll just say a few words on- Of course, on of course. Data. Yeah, so yeah. From, from our perspective, and again, as I said, in a, in a declining category, and given that uh, our lead times here in the Middle East are quite long, uh, we source all our products from Europe, and uh, eventually to stabilize the supply chain, that means we have to hold quite substantial uh, inventory on the ground. Uh, when, the, when the category is declining and the business is failing, what usually ends up happening is an inflation in, in your inventory. And then you have high costs of write-offs and that just dilutes your P&L to a point where you're no longer profitable. So for us, what IBP helped us is uh, better understand the future given the evolution of the category. So this was one. What, what does the future look like? Not only driven by, by the past, but also on the insights that we're gathering today from the situation. And uh, by providing a better forecast, we were able to properly tune our inventory. So we didn't really have any excess inventory to write off, which was quite a success story for us. The second point is because we were quite pragmatic in the approach that did actually help us over, overcome the competition. So even though on the financial aspect, it was uh, a tough year. So one of the years was, was quite tough. We did decline financially. However, we outperformed the category and we grew in market share. So overall, uh, it's not only about business growth in terms of financial, it's about beating the current situation and being able to, uh, uh, one, uh, I would say pick, pick, pick up the low hanging fruit and two, keep an eye on the fruits that are coming in the pipeline. Very well, Mustafa, thank you very much. And actually we now have the poll results and uh, interestingly, about 50% of the respondents still are, we would say, in the journey and you're probably beginning to see some results, but they're not totally quantifiable yet. About a fifth uh, is telling us business growth has been a definite uh, win, and there's also increased profits and cost reduction. But I guess what Debbie was saying us before, telling us before, is that it is not just a supply chain project. Otherwise, you will be seeing a lot more cost reduction. We're really talking here about business growth and profitability. What do you think, Debbie? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think what the 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 50%, I suppose some of it could be, as I read that, um, around we, we've started on the journey. I wonder if some of you uh, out there um, haven't uh, actually put together a business case and been measuring against that business case. And if you haven't, we would recommend it. Absolutely. Because that keeps the appetite going. Because you can keep measuring against your success and your criteria that you set. All right, so um, next questions, guys. So again, um, uh, uh, Will of mine and, and Mustafa, um, back over to you, really, because I know I did an introduction in terms of our view around prerequisites for success, but from your perspective, globally and both locally, what, what have been kind of real prerequisites on your journey to succeed? Um, I think there's there's the, the number one on top is that the GM should be convinced, motivated, and involved, committed. Any word what you can think of, that's the, by far the most important one, uh, as he is owning the process and what he is sharing with the team. Uh, that's also um, uh, what the, what the team will bring to the process and therefore be successful or not. So GM in is absolutely a must i would say um, and what i also realized is that um, the best countries of at least uh, ibp related the best countries are there the countries where you have a dedicated uh, ibp transformation uh, leader so where someone is not doing it next to his planning role or finance role or anything that it's really even though it's already for only for a project period uh, but really dedicated to make this happen um, and uh, what we also see is um, the onboarding part uh, i'm a strong believer of uh, training uh, training people and onboarding people so in this case i think it's also uh, a privilege to have everyone in the company every uh, idp participant having a uh, mandatory onboarding program to be sure everyone has their nose in the same direction, if that's an English saying. It's a Dutch saying, anyway. I understand your point, though. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mustafa. Thanks. Um, thank you. Mustafa, what, what about from your, your view from the kind of local implementation? 
Yeah, so, uh, so adding to, uh, to what Kulimwan and uh, what you said earlier as well, Debbie, um, I think what, what we need to understand about IBP is that it's not just your average process rollout. It's a proper change management because it touches not only the minds, it also touches a bit of the emotional side of the organization. And we really need to be very aware of it. It's not a program that we can initiate and within six months, everyone's up and running. It's easily a two years project. And we really need to have a very a dedicated project team to look after it. So we should always start with why are we going to implement IBP? And again, the reason why sometimes people don't don't uh, aren't able to properly assess the impact of the IBP uh, on the organization, it's because they didn't really have a clear objective. So why did we do it? Why did we go through with it? The second one is, and I think both of you guys touched touched base on it, and that's the commitment from the GM and also from the board of directors because as we said before it has a lot of the emotional and the empowerment side of it and if the board of directors are not really on board and supporting the process then a lot of the the cultural and the organization behavioral changes that that are required to have a success, successful IDP implementation will not be there uh, third i would say uh, an effective governance so definitely a dedicated person to manage it uh, and uh, probably even a core team to support the implementation and the continuous improvement. Uh, a change management and the transformation strategy. So what happens during the IBP and then what happens after the IBP rollout. Uh, and last, but definitely not least, because this is something that we kind of struggled with, is tools and automation. Because we have to keep in mind that the IBP is part of the continuous improvement um, I would say, um, uh, uh, scope of doing business. And if you come with such a big and heavy process sometimes that requires additional reports, additional meetings, people might start start to complain in the organization of just the added scope to their jobs. So what we also need to be very mindful of is what kind of productivity can we bring with us in IBP in order for people to be able to complete the tasks that are required to put the pieces of the puzzle together but still have enough time to step back and see the big puzzle once it's complete. I think that's a really good point because I think it's having a good balance, isn't it, around the people, the process and the tools. We sometimes do forget about uh, the impact that uh, such, such big and ambitious rollouts have on people that it definitely has to be at the heart of the project. Yeah. Of the rollout. Yeah, cool. Good point. Thanks, thanks, Mustafa. So I guess this this links to the, the points that you've just made. Uh, to be fair, but I, I think it would be good to understand um, and explore a little bit about. So today, within your IBP or as you guys call it, your GPS process, what is the current role of leader, the leadership team within uh, the process itself now that it's running? Stuff you want to share first from a local perspective? Sure. So, uh, fr from from my from our end, I would say the most important part, uh, the most important support that we require from the leadership team is to have a bit of forward thinking focus. Because one of the things that we struggled uh, with on um, on during the rollout is that we like to dwell on the past and we like to overanalyze the present however the future is no is the most important part of the business and this is where we need to put all our effort all our um, uh, our input and all our minds in order to be able to better understand and predict and deliver the future uh, the second thing that is also very important for us is the empowerment um, as we touched base before if the leadership team doesn't provide the, the, the organization with the right level of empowerment, what we'll end up having is a lot of decisions that were not taken at the proper levels being pushed all the way up to the board of directors meeting and taking away that really, really important time away from them uh, instead of making those really tough and really, uh, and the decisions that will move the organization forward, they'll end up just having to make most of the decisions of the organization. So one, we set forward thinking, two, we set empowerment, and three, I would say creating a safe environment uh, for each and every employee, each and every colleague to feel uh, safe enough to come forward with a risk, to challenge the forecast, 
uh, to come up with a new idea, to come up with a new initiative that would really help us shape the future. So those are the three points from my end. Fantastic. I think absolutely spot on, certainly from our perspective. Thanks, Mustafa. Absolutely, Mustafa. Yes. Will I? Yes. Um, um, I think we're in the, with the known and the beautiful position that we have a an, uh, an, uh, VP who is very much involved in uh, IDP. She's uh, strongly convinced of it. Um, and uh, she, uh, the, our board, they dedicated two hours per month to specifically talk about IDP. And what she said about it is that she um, that IDP is critical for us, so for the known. Um, to really understand how the business is performing, how are we moving towards the delivery of our targets. It allows us to stay ahead of the business because we get to look at the risks we then identify it at the country level and the opportunities that you have identified at the country level. It really gives the board uh, to co collectively look at it and assess the likelihood and the probability to make trade-offs. We build the best integrated plan. I think it's, it's beautiful. That's what she said. Um, so it means that, that uh, she is strongly convinced that with this uh, GPS to understand the market dynamics, you really can make a difference in your future. Uh, so decision making is a, is a key topic and, uh, and Mustafa already said it, uh, the empowerment to take decisions and therefore to have the time per meeting to make the decisions based for, on that level it's it's uh, wonderful because the quality at every stage is uh, much improved by that. So um, top leadership is key, and we're in the lucky position to have it. Fantastic. Thanks, Willemijn. Um, so again, over to um, people uh, on the webinar. Um, a question for you now uh, is. Uh, in terms of then ownership, so we're on to the uh, second poll. Um, who uh, actually owns integrated business planning in your business? So you've just heard the guys from uh, Danone talk about ownership uh, globally and locally in their business. Um, it does differ in organizations. You obviously know our opinion on where it should be. But again, this is an anonymous survey. Uh, it's not shared. Um, but in terms of where you see ownership in your business, is IVP owned by your CEO or general manager? Again, depending on the, the, the level in the organization. Is it owned by head of supply chain or three, head of finance, uh, four, the uh, IVP process leader, or number five, none of them? Again, uh, we just opened the poll. If you could answer that, that would be fantastic. Thanks. We'll just wait a couple of moments while your results are coming in. So it's kind of swapping and changing. Um, I'd say, so at the moment, uh, the, oh wow. So the majority, well, not majority, but a very high percentage of you, so about 36% of you have actually said that it is owned by the IVP process leader. Um, <clears throat> again, I guess if that were uh, the CEO in the organization, which I doubt very much, that would be okay. <laughs> Um, but um, that's um, that's an interesting uh, result because again, um, I guess the uh, consequence to that is if that individual is not empowered or doesn't own the strategy, um, then again you have uh, downgraded the ambition uh, of this process and what it's about. 21% uh, of you have said that it's owned by the CEO, and again you, you heard Willemine and uh, Mustafa talk about that's from their opinion. Um, and certainly their experience where the success lies, and you know that uh, clearly we, we also uh, believe in that. 27% um, of you have said that it's actually uh, owned by the head of supply chain. Uh, I'll be honest, um, that's quite common. It's a mistake, um, but it is common. Uh, and again, we would uh, implore you uh, and really uh, recommend that um, Again, head of supply chain is a very, very strong sponsor of IVP, um, but you need to push that again, try and engage the CEO in your organization so they really understand you know, what this can deliver for them so that they really get commitment and ownership. Uh, and then uh, the rest of you, nobody owns it in finance, um, and 15% of you said none of those. And I guess, I guess we would like to hear 
who those people might yes. be. And if you want to ask questions about what we think about those roles, please feel welcome. Yeah, you can still talk to us about that. But it's interesting. Anyway, there is a definite shift because if we'd done this a few years ago, we would have had majority being uh, head of supply chain. So at yeah. least it's moving in the right direction. You're right. Yeah. So um, we really want to squeeze our guests dry to today <laughs> with questions. Uh, just a couple of final questions for uh, our friends, Will and Mustafa. Um, particularly for those perhaps who are still considering um, going on an IVP journey, which other tips, which other suggestions would you make for those companies who are thinking on embarking on the journey? Willemine and Mustafa. So for, for the companies or for the individuals who want to take up the... Well, you, you can take it both ways. So uh, uh, if, if, if you allow me to share that, I, I would talk, talk a bit more from the uh, leader's perspective. So the person who would, who would take on this, uh, the profile of the person who would take on such a role. Um, I think this role requires a lot of um, EQ skills rather than just the uh, traditional IQ skills. It, it requires a lot of uh, stakeholder mapping, stakeholder management and engagement rather than just being able to process, um, I would say, complex information or complex figures. Uh, it's very people-centric uh, rather than uh, I sit on my own and I can, uh, I can follow through uh, this role uh, behind my screen. So the second point is uh, ability and ability to create proximity with the leadership team. Uh, we talked about that a lot before, so I'm not going to dwell on it. I'll pass to the third point, uh, which is this role is not a solo role. So this is not a all-star role where you can go in and uh, change the world. This is definitely a role that uh, requires someone who is capable of creating a community. Uh, my personal experience is definitely go in with with a core team. This is something we learned from the change management uh, programs. Uh, you create a core team around you. It doesn't have to be your own team, people who report into you. What we did in the implementation here in the Middle East is we invited uh, different ma managers from different functions. So we had someone from, from the marketing department, someone from the finance department, another person from the operations department. Uh, with these three people and myself, we formed the core team for GPS. And we were actually responsible of the delivery of the rollout, uh, the improvement of the process and the maintenance of the process. Uh, what this does is it helps you accelerate the integration and it helps you accelerate creating a proximity between IBP and those individual communities within the organization. Because having a person who can speak to marketeers, sales people, operations people, and finance people using their own lingo, using their own culture, using their own uh, background is quite difficult. And I would even say it's impossible. Having such a team will enab enable you build those bridges faster and maintain them. Uh, so we said EQ, alignment with the leadership team. Uh, it's not a solo role. Uh, the fourth point is you definitely need to pack your sports shoes this is not a sprint. It's a very long marathon. And I think this is why all of us here are <laughs> quite into sports. Uh, and the last one is uh, resilience. Uh, there's a lot of obstacles in implementing an IVP. And uh, if the person who's trying to, to roll it out doesn't really perceive every, every obstacle as an opportunity to improve and to build on, then maybe, maybe you want to reconsider the, uh, that, uh, that decision. Very well. So, uh, yeah. dear listeners, you know what you need to do: buy yourself some good sports shoes and get get fit for the <laughs> for the race. So, the last uh, and actually, Mustafa, thank you for not saying use use Oliver White. We would say that, but you're not supposed to do it. Uh, can we move to the last one then? Um, it goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, obviously, I guess everyone's very curious now to uh, hear a bit about. Okay, so. You've done great things. What's coming next? You know, what's what's next in your GPS journey? Um, yes, uh, one of the one of the main things for us to integrate is uh, the customer view. 
So really the voice of the customer have that one integrated all the way back from the customer uh, all the way towards uh, the factory. Uh, the customer is key, yes, as the known we also state that, but to really put it in the, in the backbone process of the company, that's the next step. Um, we also want to improve uh, tools where we are in uh, multinational and we have a lot of uh, obstacles there. So uh, I need to be fitter than this <laughs> uh, to get there. But anyway, uh, uh, it would be good to, to, to see if we can have uh, uh, tools uh, to help us with, with our uh, scenario planning and with our uh, planning in general. Um, and also what we now are looking for is how to measure success. When do you know if you're successful? And yes, we have a health check and we have assessments and of course we have Oliver White to help us. Um, however, we also want to see if we can measure success from a 360 degree. So really from the business performance itself, as we see uh, in the sheets from uh, Debbie and Flavio that uh, IBP can bring uh, business results. Uh, we want to measure that. We want to see if the process is robust enough. So if, if someone is uh, getting another job, does it still exist? Uh, and also we want to see if uh, people are aware the knowledge of the about the process so, so to see if there's onboarding we have an e-learning we have a campus on IDP uh, we have uh, trainings per country but we also have uh, cross assessments per uh, division so we have a lot of tools and templates and trainings available uh, and we want to extend that thank you Thank you, Willemijn. Mustafa, anything from you? So I think from, from our side, it's just uh, to be able to continue the journey, uh, because again, as we said, it's, it's more of mar marathon. We don't really want to, uh, to forget about the baton. We want to keep passing it from, uh, uh, from one team to the other, from one GM to the other. And this is when, when it gets a bit tricky, I think, as well. Um, worth mentioning it to, to the community who, uh, who joined in to listen to us. Uh, one of the biggest challenges you might face in an IBP rollout is actually the maintenance post rollout, especially when you have uh, a rotation of key people who were supporting the process. And I think Debbie, you, you spoke of that as well uh, several times when, when you were visiting us here in the Middle East. Yeah, good point. It's about sustainability, isn't it? And, and maybe one more thing to add here, it's also a lot about enthusiasm about the process. If you really see what it can bring, and, and, and uh, it's shown here as well, and it also feels like it, it, it you can barely be not uh, enthusiastic about it. So it's, it's uh, if you're strongly convinced of what it can bring, you also spread the word and people feel motivated to continue because yes, it's an, ongoing continuous improvement plan and as soon as you drop your energy you will see that it's poor, you know, collapsing a bit and then when you bring the energy back again it's uh, growing so uh, use your enthusiasm because it's a beautiful concept very good thanks guys so um i guess in terms of the questions um there's a number of you who have been asking some questions during the webinar but if you do have any uh please do send them to us uh, now um i suppose um from a question point of view this so we can reach out to uh, willamine and mustafa because i'm sure the audience are, are keen to get your view on this as well uh, one of the questions that came through um from uh, one of the attendees was around time so, you know, what's the typical time it takes to stabilize the process? So once we've implemented or designed the process and implemented IBP, how long does it take? And I'm using the words um, from the question, which was to stabilize the process. I would verbalize that as to achieve a capable process. Um, I guess from, from Flavio and I, um, in terms of our experience, the actual design uh, doesn't take long at all. Um, you know, again, in even the most complex businesses where you are designing this locally and globally, it is no more than three to five months for that design and to get going. Um, so again, hence why we you know, strongly enforce quickly. So start quickly, but be prepared. It will be ugly. Um, and then post implementation, 
Uh, organizations learn by doing the process so they evolve every cycle uh, and uh, being very clear on the journey focusing on what's working and it's not what's not so you need to inject uh, a, a process and kind of uh, behavior of continuous improvement uh, during that journey so really setting your sights on this is what we want the process to be this is what we need to do so um, again uh, Willemine and Mustafa did refer to a standard so certainly within uh, the uh, Danone organization, there is a standard of what good looks like. Uh, and therefore, and, and we would strongly uh, endorse that, is that, again, being very clear on that standard and having your organization uh, working to achieving that standard. And that typically, again, in um, organizations, again, to varying degrees, dependent on your complexity, can take, I would say, between 12 and 18 cycles. Uh, again, if you're a very a simple, non-complex organization. We're based in one country, one plant, probably 12 cycles to achieve capable. Again, if it's more complex, 18. In my organization, where we rolled this out across 103 sites, that took nearly three years. Uh, again, and that was from start to finish, where all of those sites achieved that capable level. Um, Again, over to, to you guys, Willemar and Mustafa. Have you got any any kind of insights into time? How long it's taken you? No, I think it's it's uh, around the same. I think the design took around um, three, four months maybe, and then the implementation per CBU, let's say around twelve months of uh, cycles, nine to twelve months maybe, oh. that you're really oh. in your routine and therefore that you have uh, time left to uh, for continuous improvements yeah 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 very good um another question i think this is this is a um a really good question so this is around so again someone's made an observation is that you know we've done a good job kind of talking about some of the hard metrics and the performance levels um that can demonstrate uh, improvement in the organization um, but then again, the question here is it, it, it's excellent because it, it's also around how do we improve collaboration or trust in the organization? So how do we demonstrate that trust has improved? How do we demonstrate or how do we drive that, uh, I guess, collaboration uh, across the, the, the business through IBP? Um, again, I would say, Flavio, jump in uh, when, when you want. But from our perspective, um, you know there are there are metrics that demonstrate that we trust each other and um, so again what we often see in organizations where trust does not exist uh, will be a behavior of bias and you can measure that um, and the behavior of bias is we are consistently over optimistic or we are consistently too conservative uh, and if we're doing that we're not telling each other the truth and therefore we don't trust each other so again a metric to demonstrate that we do tell the truth um, and that we are um, uh, achieving uh, our commitments is to uh, measure and eliminate bias in the organization. And that's throughout. That belongs to product, to the, the portfolio team, it belongs to the demand team, and it belongs to supply. So again, from a trust perspective, we need to demonstrate that we do what we said we were going to do in the first place. And I would just add very briefly that where we see um best IBP happening is where there is a strong change management program to support and with uh, with uh, human resources really stepping in and being uh, the torch bearers for this change management and as uh, Debbie says for eliminating bad behaviors for the process. Yeah. Guys, Willamine, Mustafa, uh, I think this is, sorry, go on Willamine, go ahead. Yeah, what's maybe maybe relevant to share here, at least that's what I've um, uh, perceived in this case, is uh, our trust grew in the known per, per country. And uh, when you see that really these cross-functional teams start to work together and that they come out with an aligned view on either uh, innovations or on their uh, top, the, their, uh, top line growth uh, activities, or on their plan, whatever, at least that there's an aligned view and that they all can uh, feel responsible, that they are all able to, if needed, uh, kind of defend their plans. So that it should be a cross-functional team. And, and, and really that make, made us, um, uh, to, uh, when, when you're together in a room with the other functions and you start 
to talk with each other over and over again, you start to understand each other and you start uh, to get the trust to challenge each other. So that, that was for us a uh, big eye-opener here. Thank you very much, William and Mustafa. Yep. I'm afraid mm -hmm. we need to draw the webinar to a close. I know there are still lots of people asking questions, but unfortunately we can the that. time is over and we can answer them offline. Thank you very much again, Danone. Uh, excellent products. You make our children very happy. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I have three, by the way. So I know a bit about it. Debbie, <laughs> any final words? Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much for taking part. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.